What's going on, everybody? Hope you are having a wonderful week so far. Ah, before we start, give us a subscribe, give us a review, give us a like, give us a comment. Um, also, in the comments, let us know if you want to see any other artists come on, um, any requests, or just drop me a DM, drop me a comment on, on the socials, whatever you want to do. Um, just let us know who you want to hear on the podcast. Podcast time. Matthias Paul, a.k.a. Paul Van Dyke. Um, this guy has been at the forefront of electronic music trance for, well, since the 90s. Um, 34 years in the game at this moment in time. Absolutely amazing achievement as a career generally, let alone in the music industry. I don't really need to give him an introduction, but I wanted to get one of the... I don't really like using the word legend because he's still at it and still touring more than most artists in the world could ever wish for. Uh, he's still releasing music, still very important to him, and I really respect him as a human being, as an artist, and as somebody that's pushing the electronic music industry forward. So without further ado, Paul Van Dyke. Paul Van Dyke, how are you doing, sir? Hello, I'm very good. Thank you for having me. Thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. Um, we've we've had history in the past, and I don't think you're you're never gonna remember this because I look very I look very different, um, and we also have some mutual friends. And I don't I really don't like doing this on the podcast because usually like somebody comes on here and is like, "Who the fuck is this dude?" Um, but back in oh, I got 2008, 2009. Um, you were playing Cream at Amnesia. Um, Tom Brown, who runs mm. all of the podcasts for Cream, I was the guy that was running, recording the podcast with with Tom. Ah, all right. So yeah, it was. Um, that was a very long time ago. Um, and I believe the last show you played at Amnesia for, or at Cream, um. I'm not too sure what if it was your birthday or something like that, or there was there was some celebration and I really can't remember. Um, but that was my last time working the podcast as well. So it was a very long time ago. But I was talking to Tom Tom Brown the other day and he sends his love and says hi. Okay, please please send him my best <laughs> regards back then. I will, man. I will. How uh, how are you? I am very good. Little jet lagged still. Just got back from the States yesterday, so, um, you know, still a bit twisted in, in the time zones. But yeah. uh, other than that, everything's cool. Are you still based out of Berlin? Yes, still still here. And, uh, yeah, everything's fine. Amazing, man, amazing. Um, I wanted to get you on the podcast. Your, your career has been a very long one and a very successful one. Um, and uh, we I have a lot of listeners on here that kind of are at the start of their careers and I think it can kind of be extremely daunting on how to even have a successful career in this music industry um, mm. and I guess for me having you on you are a proof that you can have longevity in this in this what we call the music industry um, and I'm really interested to kind of dig in from how it started for you at the beginning to where we are today in a sense of the peaks and troughs of your careers the the amazing times the bad times the effects that it's had on your life the effects that it's had on your personal life so i think i kind of want to start from the get-go is when did you have your first break well i i, I think it's like you know when people look at it everyone sort of feels very different about what's the first break yeah um you know obviously the very first time i ever played in front of people was uh, such a moment for me but so was having the test pressing of my very first release in my hand and i remember being in the subway in berlin and and, and just having it just picked it up and I, I was just like kind of like a happy kid at christmas yeah. and easter and birthday and all together so um so all in all i think it's you know all in the early 90s really it's like no particular date 
I like that though because I think there's a lot of people that, like you said, would have a specific uh, like let's say for instance like the first time you had a big record or like for me is like when I had a, my first big record I can I think a lot that's when people's first time knowing who I was but there's lots of little goals throughout the beginning of your career that actually is the first first achievement that I think a lot of people don't really realize in that, that, that kind of takes in into a career yeah, I'm pretty sure a lot of people probably would say for an angel when it yeah. came out in 98, but then again, the first release was in 94. 94. So yeah. to me, it's a very different, <laughs> uh, um, like way of looking at it. And it's, mm. it's also, you know, I'm, I'm very passionate about what I do. So it's like more those little moments yeah. that actually have that importance rather than, I don't know, some sort of position in some sales charts of a record or something. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. So talking about, I want to, I want to go into that with For an Angel. It came out in 1994 and then got re-released re in 98 or was it, did it just kind of hit a storm in 1998? No, it was more that, uh, you know, that the, the UK record label, Deviant Records, yeah. they obviously, they signed my second album, Seven Ways First. Yeah. And then 45 RPM, which included For an Angel as the second album, and they wanted to have a single from my very first album as well. And since For an Angel never came out as a single, they thought, well, that could be a really good track to kind of put out. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, it was the first time it was released as a single, and it was, uh, yeah, um, basically creating a very special moment for a lot of people who still to this day say this is uh you know one of their tracks that got them into electronic music mm, yeah it's definitely like one of those records that has been around that kind of brings back memories i guess what's your relationship with that record well it is um uh, well, it's an important track of mine. It's like, you know, in every yeah. single thing I've ever done, even the ones where I kind of look back at now and say, hmm, I could have done that better. Um, you know, they're still, they're all part of my career. And obviously it's like, there's not a single show that I've played anywhere since back then that people not asking, please play for an angel, play for yeah. an angel. Now I keep it interesting for me by basically playing it different every single time I'm playing out. Because of the equipment that I use on stage, you know, it's not with CD players or back then with vinyl, of course, but now it's more like a mini performance recording studio that I have with me. And so I'm able to play it different all the time and give it a different sort of momentum every single time I'm playing it. Does that keep it fresh for you? Yeah, it's, it, it, it's keeping it alive to me, you know, it's like not an audio file that I recorded like many, many years ago and then I'm just playing back. It's yeah. kind of like almost like an ongoing project, but that's with every single piece of music I've ever done. And going going on the like the live, not like like what you said, your your setup is on stage. I remember seeing like early parts of it back into in the early two thousands, and you were kind of really the first person really doing it from like a DJ point of, point of view that I that I ever saw. Hmm. Um, what was the reasoning behind doing doing that and kind of keeping that forward? Well, you know, like many others of my colleagues back then, we all played vinyl and yeah. uh, I was pretty good at beat matching. So, and the records were like eight minutes long and I was just kind of like, hmm, what are we going to do now? <laughs> and um, so it was always the side of being a producer and the musician in me that wanted to kind of do more. And in the moment it was possible, to bring uh, studio equipment, studio elements with me on stage and using them actually, um, that that's what I did. Because I'm a real geek when it comes down to electronic music and I really wanted to be presented in the best possible way. And to me, being as interactive as I am with the, the equipment that I use and how I play my music, this is this is a very essential element of of what I do and what drives me still to this day. And that makes every single show another high point in my life. Yeah, no, I really respect that. I respect that. Um, growing up in Berlin, did you grow up in Berlin? Uh, I grew up in Berlin, yeah. I was born in a small town near the Polish border called yeah. Eisenhüttenstadt. Yep. And then when I was, I think I was like five or six, my mom 
and I we moved to Berlin, and then I grew up in East Berlin. Okay, East Berlin in the seventies. Um, I don't know really that much about it. So like, I think we moved when I, yeah, it was sort of more like the eighties really. Okay, that I got there, so. so Berlin in the eighties, how was that? I don't know. I was like, you know, every kid just kind of like, yeah. you know, having my close surrounding, my mom, few friends. And then in, I think it was in maybe, I think it was 83, actually. Um, I was always listening to the radio when I used to do my homework. Mm. And um, so it's like, you know, that's when I first discovered music that's like very unique, very special, very different. And it was a band called The Smiths and the track Hand in Glove. It was the first time that music actually or let's put it this way music kind of came out of the shadow of the background noise into the prominent element yeah uh, um, that you really focus and listening to and you know since i grew up in east germany i could not buy any records buy any magazines read anything about the people um that i was listening to and also i uh I didn't learn any English, obviously, because it was, yeah. you know, um, the socialist communist country. So we had to learn Russian. Yeah. And I never knew what they were singing, but it was the pure music that sort of reached out to me. So I can obviously later on, I kind of understood what Morrissey was singing there, which was, you know, <laughs> edgy at, at best. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so, um, yeah, it, it was like this and it was... You know, it was a single mom raising a kid in a, you know, Eastern European country. And I always, because it's the truth, I never really missed anything because what you don't know, you don't miss. Totally, yeah. And, uh, you know, my mom tried to kind of like pretty much give me everything I wanted. Mm. And what I wanted probably wasn't that much because I didn't know that much. <laughs> yeah, I love that. 89, the wall comes down. What changes in your life? Well... A lot. First of all, it has to say, it's like my mom and I, we left East Germany uh, prior to that because okay. we had something, it's called Ausreiseantrag. It's something that probably only exists in, in Germany, therefore in East Germany back then. It's an application, especially you applying to leave the citizenship and therefore the country. Oh, wow. And uh, obviously that was, um, you know, connected with a lot of issues and, mm. and, and struggles within the communist society in east germany and um so we were anyway we were allowed to leave in the end which was one week before the wall went down wow so we um we moved to hamburg i was in hamburg in front of the telly um seeing the news running through that the berlin wall um you know has a hole <laughs> <laughs> how does that change music culturally for for Germany, for for you as well, and how does that kind of affect your? Because eighty nine, let's say for instance, I'm just using this nineteen ninety four. For an angel came out eighty nine, not lo not that long ago. After, um, what kind of changes in your life to kind of go? Okay, I'm writing trance music. Well, I I think it's not so much not so much just myself. It really you have to you know it's like they're obviously in a sort of like late eighties there was a lot of like the early house music you know Chicago yeah. Detroit all that drive was there and that inspired a lot of people in Europe already to make some more let's say danceable stuff because if you listen to let's say eighties Italo disco yeah and you take the cheesy jungle samples away. It's already pretty electronic -y and, mm. um, you know, the bass lines have a very progressive element to it. So there was a lot of that was already there. But I believe that, um, you know, especially in Berlin, and I also still to this day think that's the importance of Berlin for electronic music in general. There was a very small scene in West Berlin, maybe 100, 150 people. And there were a lot of East Berlin kids that were only able to listen to the radio. Yeah. So all that energy basically crashed into the club scene in a very positive way. And that sort of sparked that musical revolution in a way. And if you think about it as well, you know, it's like the Blake Baxters of this world, it's like they became yeah. an international success after coming to Berlin, playing in Berlin, and then it spread. 
Yeah. And I believe uh, this is this is the importance. And another thing is as well is the situation in Berlin back then. Obviously, a lot of the factories in East Berlin, they went out of business. So there were huge spaces, huge warehouses. Mm. The administration wasn't in place yet. So people just went in, put a few boxes and 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 made kind of like a preliminary club out of it and created like a party at atmosphere with the music that we loved so much. But we're still talking about even after the reunification, maybe three, four hundred people at most in Berlin yeah. that you would call being interested in that kind of music. And then obviously it grew, it became more and more popular. It's like there was something in Berlin called the Laugh Parade as well, mm. uh, which became more and more popular and, and grew. And for me, um, it wasn't so much um, that, I don't know, I had a particular agenda or something. I just started to make tapes for myself and some friends. And I always kind of had a somewhat different approach. It wasn't the more distorted, the higher it is, the better the track. To me, it had to have the energy. It had to also have a sense of, uh, of melody to it. Yeah. And there was a lot of that music out there too, but there was also a very substantial element and a big gap missing. <laughs> but there was a gap and the element was missing. And I just basically yeah, started making music that I wanted to hear. Yeah, music that I missed. And that was the same with many, many, many people. And I really think this is why electronic music in them, as you mentioned before, in a matter of four or five years suddenly became this huge and this popular because people, we couldn't just switch on the radio or, or kind of like click on some Spotify playlist and listen to whatever we wanted to hear. The music did not exist. We had to make it. Yeah. And that, and that's obviously a very, um, I don't know, special approach to being a music fan yeah no i think it's absolutely amazing because also uh i think we're back and i'm really not too sure what happened there i hope we didn't lose what just happened because that was a really good conversation um let me just i'm just got to double check that okay. we didn't lose that because that was good uh no we didn't lose it great cool um we're back. Yeah, what I was saying, we live in a society now where everything is at our fingertips. We can, we have the ability to go and listen to music, to go and buy clothes, to learn anything we want music-wise. Um, literally anything creatively, we can go onto YouTube and learn how to do it, right? Whether or not we we put the time and effort into to actually making it, but we can. Um, do you think that's changed... Or, or when you when you started making music, was there a was there something in you that was like pushing forward to to create that? Because I, I feel like what I'm trying to get at is that it feels way easier nowadays to to make music, to release music, and and I feel like there's a, a level of having to work harder back when you were to to create something that you really wanted to create. Well, there's like there are multiple aspects to it. One thing is I think that's like a, always a good example. Um, you know, a lot of these kind of, let's say, aggressive kind of attacky sounds yeah. that we love so much in our music, they simply did not really exist. Yeah. I remember actually kind of, you know, one of my signature sounds that like this kind of, kind of hard, edgy kind of thing. I created it by putting a microphone cable into a guitar distortion and sampling it and then actually put it on the keyboard and then be able to play it. So you had to be really come creative and come up with like ideas like this. Yeah. Or my, my first hired, the hired on for an angel is actually hairspray yeah. because I didn't have a drum <laughs> machine. And if you do a hairspray, it does like, tsh, tsh, tsh. you sample it and then you can play a hired, you know, and it's stuff like this that obviously kind of like, um, I don't know, triggers an urge to find new things, interesting things. Yes, it is much easier these days because the technology is there. You most likely, even in the presets, find some really decent sounds to use, but still you need to be creative. You still have to make something from it. And I give you an example, maybe kind of like back in the 90s when doing the vinyl days, maybe, I don't know, 150 records came out every week. 
And when I went to the record store, I maybe got 10 of them and maybe two of them made it into my set. Yeah. Now, now I don't know, maybe 10,000, 50,000 tracks every week. 120,000 a day gets released on Spotify. Oh, well, then here we go. But it's still only about two tracks that even make it into my set. <laughs> so it's just kind of like something that's switched here. It's just the quantity, the quality in itself that at least that I'm looking for something. It's, it's always very subjective, of course. Yeah, of course. Um, uh, it, it, it's still kind of the same. And obviously, as you just said, 120,000 songs on Spotify every day. So... Back in the day, there were people at the record label, there were people that sort of also loved music and they said, well, that doesn't sound so good. It's like, maybe try this, maybe try that. So all that is gone. So in the moment somebody thinks, okay, that's cool, out it is. And yeah. very, very often it is not. Mm. How do you find that's affecting our culture in electronic music? Um. Well, let's put it this way. I'm hearing a lot of things again um, that I already heard. We had in the sort of late 90s, we had, um, I would call it a rather unique style of electronic dance music. We called it Kermis techno, which is sort of funfair techno. The stuff yeah. that you hear when you do like the loops on like those sort of, you know, celebrations in the city center or something. Yeah. And I have to say, I'm hearing a lot of that right now as being something rather new and surprisingly as well from uh, DJs or DJs who kind of are supposedly on the forefront of electronic music in 2024. And I have to say, maybe they're the element of trying to find something sparkling, something inspiring, something new is missing because if you go back and you are just inspired by something that already came out 30 years ago that's not necessarily anyhow artistically interesting at least not to me yeah i i agree i think there's a level of that because i think i speak about this quite often in with friends off the podcast and sometimes occasionally on the podcast but i feel like there's a level of laziness when it comes to working out how, working out what to write um, I, I i don't even um, I, I i look the thing is i don't even think it is laziness i mm. think something that um and you can ask it, it doesn't matter if you are writing books or do paintings or photography you inspired by your surroundings you inspired by what you see but that means you also need that interface that translate whatever inspires you, whatever surrounds you into your personal art form. And uh, I have to say, there seems to be a lack of it um, yeah. how, uh, uh, in some points. How do you feel that could come back? How do, how do you personally bring, bring inspiration back? Because you're still releasing music, right? We're nearly, you're nearly 30 years, or you are 30 mm -hmm. years of releasing records, right? yeah the 20 years um like that's a long time and your your music isn't you're not releasing the same records of what you were releasing back in the 90s to now you're still releasing fresh music well the the thing is i'm i'm, I'm actually i'm a real as i mentioned before i'm a geek it's like you know i yeah. love electronic music and i love hearing music that drives me that has something that captures me if it's from like some sort of more soft, fluffy stuff to really banging to the core. But, you know, let's say taking a quote from something that that was there, that uh, was an inspiration, that's totally fine. But just like remodeling an already outdated music genre and selling it as something new, it is... I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's not my approach to making music. Put it this way. Yeah, I guess. I guess playing devil's advocate, there is a level of the kids that are going to, and I don't mean that in a condescending way, but the kids that are going to clubs now that they they get younger. We get older, they get younger, right? Um, as in a sense of eighteen year olds going to a, going to a show, they nest they haven't necessarily heard 
that type of music before and um, this is the first time they're hearing it you know the the difference from let's say you know from the music that i described as kermis techno yeah in the 90s was that this music really stayed in the normal discotheques yeah. that music had nothing to do with club culture mm. and now it's pretending to be part of clubby club. music and uh, and and this is something where and again, it's like, look, it's very subjective. I'm pretty sure a lot of people love it. So who am I to criticize it? But I'm looking at it from an, from an, from an artist's point of view, from someone who loves that music so much and from mm. someone who's disappointed if I have to listen to something that I already <laughs> know for 30 years and didn't like 30 years ago. <laughs> no, I totally agree with you. I, I feel exactly the same. And I feel like there's fewer and fewer artists that are willing that that have the ability aka the platform the the ability to reach people i feel like there's fewer and fewer artists that are willing to just like push the envelope on being extremely creative and giving people new fresh music that isn't a regurgitation of old music yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's still a lot of them. It's just of like, course. you know, as I just said, 120,000 tracks. Mm. I mean, I'm seriously, as you can see, I'm impressed by that number. I didn't even know <laughs> a day. Um, it is very difficult to kind of like shine through yeah. if you miss the algorithm. You know, yeah. if you make something else, if you make something different, you do not show up in the algorithm of favorites, yeah. to put it this way. So therefore... The music fans, the people that really love music, they find these people and, yeah. and, and they are there. But and on that level, it might be a little harder these days because all the channels, all the possibilities of bringing new people over to your audience are stuffed with a lot of very samey things. Yeah. How do you feel that that lasts, though? in in the sense of the uh, our genre of electronic music how do you think that that plays out in the future i i honestly i don't know there's like mm. one thing obviously like it's almost kind of having a a glass ball and looking into it and see how is social media going to develop how is this yeah. going to move forward the thing is that sort of i'm somewhat concerned is that some uh, people call themselves artists and including AI and in the composing and the producing process. Yeah. Um, what's an AI going to do rather than yeah. actually recreating based on algorithm what's already there? So it's like it's something that I have to say dismiss as an artist full force. I'm all pro technology and I love everything that actually comes with it. But if it comes down to creativity, um. Uh, as I mentioned before, that interface that sort of translates whatever is inspiring into whatever art form you do, that is very, very human. You can't yeah. really digitalize that or do anything. I, I don't think a computer will ever be inspired by a sunset. Yeah. No, I totally agree. And I think there's a level of the the... I think a classic example for me was during during COVID lockdown when live streams became popular and there was so many people going, this is the future. Live streaming is the future and in-person shows are going to become less and less. And I was just thought it was utter bullshit because it was just like, no, we, we are humans and we need human connection. And there's a level of using technology which can can benefit all of us however that human human touch human interaction human feelings will never go away i i am a firm believer of that I, I, I totally agree there's like nothing better than actually standing in the middle of a crowd listening to your favorite track being played by your favorite artist with, your, is... with your best friends around you yeah of course it's just like it's just like something that's i don't know special and extraordinary so talking about that, um, I I'm I'm not a trance producer. I'm not a trance DJ. Um, however, I've always kind of stood on the outside of the trance community and been ex been extremely envious of the trance community, in a sense that 
they are extremely dedicated to the DJs and the the genre of music. What was that about? Um, I don't. I well, I I don't know. I think the look. The thing is, when I play a piece of music, then I play a piece of music because I really, really love it. And uh, I think this is coming across, and this is what people connect to. Yeah. It's like I, I played once or twice in my whole career, and I know exactly what it was and when it was. Um, a track that I didn't fully love. Yeah. And I know these moments, and that's mm. why I try to avoid them. So every single thing that you hear me play, I'm 100% bringing it across. And I think this might be something that is, uh, I don't know, very special. It's like, you know, nobody is trying to pretend to be this or that, to be kind of overly cool or to be overly that. It's just simply about high-quality electronic music with an element of, of energy, with a an element of being human, therefore the melodies in it. And, and I think this is what's really important. And then another thing as well, this is why also I think trance in itself doesn't necessarily have the best image. A lot of people try to make that, but there's a very, very thin line between yeah. um, a cool, classy melody hook line versus being utterly cheesy. <laughs> I 100% agree with you on that. And I think what what why do you think trance had that? Like because there's a lot of genres that have had extreme commerciality, right? Extreme commerciality including trance. But what do you think trance why why trance has do you think has kind of had that um kind of facade that it's cheesy? Um I, I think a, a, a little bit could probably come from, uh, you know, if if you look if you look at a techno club, everybody was. I mean, I wear black all the time, so it's like yeah. you know, I include myself. We have that sort of like uniform of black pants, black trainers, black t-shirts. So you know, yeah. all kind of like grey and miserable <laughs> looking. And then and then you look at a proper trans show. You see people in colors and smiles and whatnot. And if you, let's say, you come from your grim day to day and you see all these happy people, you're just like, what the heck's wrong with them? Yeah. And I really think uh, in some sort of subconscious way, maybe that's part of it. Because if you look at like the all over amount of electronic music, a good trance track is far harder to make than many other things because you need to be able to understand musicology. It's like, you know, you have to understand what certain, um, you know, chords actually do and what, yeah. what sounds good. And as I said, it's a very thin line between cheesy melody and a classy melody. And in terms of producing, simply because it's much faster, it's yeah. also... Um, you know, you need to know about compression. You need to know about producing a track. Yeah. And uh, so if it comes down to that, a lot of the really good trance records are actually little masterpieces of electronic music. No, I I couldn't take that away. I think especially with what you were saying about the clothing and the community, is it stands alone to be in its own genre um and it, you know a trance crowd when you see a trance crowd which is really interesting to me because i think there's no really <sighs> it's music goes in and out of fashion right trance is almost trance is is coming back now right from 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 an outsider's point of view there's a a movement of trance that's also coming back however it's never gone away for you it's always been there for you and you being one of the biggest trance djs if not the biggest trance dj ever how does how do you how do you feel when people talk badly on the genre well it's it's kind of like a bit strange especially as an example to me the biggest trance record of 23 was done by one of the biggest techno djs so okay. it's all kind of mix mashing and what uh, record was that uh legends by adam okay. bayer 
Yeah. It's, it's just like it's a pure trance record. I don't know what why people call it techno. Yeah, I, it, it just isn't. It's like everything about the track, the drive, the bang, the, the, the melody, the emotions, the goosebumps, the build up, everything. This is pure trance. This is what trance should sound in 23 or 24. Yeah. And then at the same time, um, you know, people um, are very snobby about actually the terminology trance, which is kind of strange. But, you know, at the same time, you know, this record to me is probably the record of the year 2023 and it had not much to do with techno. It's, it's it very interesting to see how techno and trance now is literally very similar. In in a lot of cases for me, I, I, I see techno or a lot of what everyone is saying is techno for me is trance. And obviously that's just a personal opinion. I'm not right or wrong. Um, and I'm not going to die on the hill for it. But what's your thoughts and why do you feel that this has gone this way, but they're not calling it trance? Um, well, <laughs> the reason why they're not calling it trance is probably some sort of image thing. As we say, it's like, you know, the terminology yeah. in itself is probably not uh, seen as cool as it should be because of the quality of the music genre. At the same time, to me, it was never separate. If yeah. we listen to kind of like things like tracks I've done like many, many years ago, even like Avenue, this is like it's tech trends to its core in a way and many, yeah. many other sort of like things. And um, I don't know, I, I just always liked a straightforward, heavy bass drum with kind of like a banging bass line. And yes, I like a break where you kind of feel like, wow, and that wow usually is not just a simple hi hat, you know. There's yeah. like some music color, some music element that actually is, needs to be part of it for me at least. But you know, everything we talk here is is indeed very subjective. Why people that make clear trends inspired techno records call it this, and do not want to acknowledge it, should maybe ask them. <laughs> Yeah, because I think there's levels of like uh, we we know there's huge amounts of snobbery in this industry, right? We know we know there is, um, but I'm just it it's kind of just feels a little fake. It feels like they're just it's not really being authentically themselves by calling it something that it's it's not. Like at the end of the day for me it does you you can hear me and i don't know how many interviews say that i'm not just a trans dj i yeah. make electronic music and it's mostly danceable that's yeah. what i do and i think if we come back to that and just let a stack a, a track stand for itself in its beauty and its drive and the connectivity to the audience then that's it why why calling it something why calling me trans and adam bayer techno if we most probably could be making a really cool track together because we love those elements very obviously where i mean i'm just taking it from the music i heard him making yeah, but uh, it's just like it's about the music more than mm. anything and um it always has been for me at least and uh, so look i believe people that love music they they don't care i'm pretty sure my let's say trans audience love that legend tracks from 23 just as much as i do yeah no i love that i love that um vandit when did you start the record label Ooh, I, I i think we started it in 98 99 and it was officially registered as a company in 2000. <laughs> <laughs> okay running a record label for over 20 years how has it changed over time how do you run it as a business how does how do things change like that from over the last 20 years well first of all it's like you know i have to say it's like i always had like an amazing team and still have yeah. an amazing team actually it's like doing all this core administrative all the tricky work and so on i think what has not changed to maybe start with that is we release exactly the music that we like we do not yeah. make any compromises um in in anyway whatsoever um we noticed especially over the last two or three years a little bit starting with the pandemic that people um they they like labeling things even more mm -hmm. so 
uh, you know, we created Vended Alternative as an example where we released the more proggy, techier things uh, versus what you would probably call proper trends. I don't, I don't, I don't know. It's it it's really difficult with the all this all this labeling, but you know, of course, in the beginning, our main focus was on releasing vinyls, and then um, you know, we had all the issues, and then um, like like the whole music industry of uh, you know everything becoming digital and just like available and downloadable for free. And it was not the easiest times because we also have to pay our artists, you know, it's like not that the record label is just like pocketing it in. Uh, it is, um, it is for the people who make the music, the, you know, the more they can live of it, the more all those beautiful tracks they can deliver to the audience. Agreed. And uh, obviously things have, um, since then changed. We have, music platforms and so on. But we kind of have the same issues as we spoke about, um, you know, those musicians that do something that that is unique, that is special, that doesn't fit the algorithm. Mm. And, uh, you know, it is tricky to shine through 120,000 releases a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough time releasing records. And I think it's the the market's changed massively for artists as well i think it's so easy and readily available for artists to to release their own music and to still potentially have the ability to push through the algorithm rather than what a record label can can do nowadays it, it feels very similar what's your thoughts on that well it seems it's more important you have like 10 um super duper seconds on TikTok than actually making a red track. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm... how do you feel about that? How do you feel about that? Honestly, <laughs> look, I'm, I'm a musician and I love music. So yeah. to me, it's much more important what the person is releasing musically than how the person is presented on TikTok or what stupid dance is being done in a TikTok loop. Yeah. Um, I know this is all really important and obviously we are part of the whole social media thing. And what I like about it a lot is the direct communication that is mm. indeed possible. Yeah. But if this becomes, let's say the main selling point and not the music, then obviously it is a questionable approach. Yeah. How, how do you grow as an artist coming up nowadays by just worrying about the music? Because I think it, like you, you came from a time where you, before social media, you had a, a very successful career, right? And that has carried on. You now have half a million followers on Instagram. I've not checked your TikTok because I can't stand the platform. But like the you you have a huge following. Okay, let's say for instance you were to start out today again. Like, how does that look for you? Like, how do you feel that that can be done to the level of where you're at? Look. I think this is like a really complex yeah, of question. Yeah. And we need to look at like a far wider sort of sort of like, you know, array of things that sort of come into play. As I said before, yeah. it is how is gonna social media, how is social media gonna develop? How yeah. are we gonna actually be in the future? It's like I mean, I read the other day that this whole like AI bot thing that communicates with you and become your new bestie on any of those platforms. I mean, is this really going to be the future? Is this really where it's going to be? Then obviously mm -hmm. musicians that actually put their heart and their creativity in going to have a really hard time. But if it's really about actually like, you know, connecting as humans, understanding each other, uh, talking to each other, respecting each other's points and different ways of being, yeah. then that music is going to also have a possibility because that sort of goes into the, the same range. It's almost the soundtrack of a civilized world. It's a tough one, isn't it? Yeah. And it's really, it's really, I, I love these conversations because we never know. We don't know what it's going to be like. We don't know what it's going to be like tomorrow. We don't know what it's going to be like in 10 years time, um, which is why I like hearing other people's opinions. Um, Ibiza. Obviously, my first interaction with you was in Ibiza. 
I know Ibiza has been a huge part of your career over the years. Um, what was your first time in Ibiza? I think it was in 1999 and I was playing at Pasha for Renaissance. Oh, wow. Yeah, not necessarily a musical fit, I have to say, but <laughs> um, that was my first time. And it was kind of weird because the DJ booth at Pasha uh, at the time was sort of like in the walkway on the way in. Yeah. So it was kind of really strange and I didn't really understand what is all the fuss mm. about Ibiza until I played uh, for Cream at Amnesia and then I knew, okay, that's why people travel here from all over the world actually to celebrate life for two weeks out of the whole year. What where, what year was your, can you remember what year your first uh, Amnesia party was? I think that was 2000. 2000, yeah. Cream was... Uh, Cream, for me, Cream was the night on the island for God knows how many years, like you said, where people would travel just for that for that party. They created something that was also during the time of you had manumission. Circle Loco at DC10, We Love Space on Sundays, Cream on Thursdays. There were iconic parties in, in Ibiza. What changed? <laughs> No, I've, look, I'm I'm not a pro into the politics of Ibiza, honestly. Yeah. As much as I'm, you know, one of the longest running residents on the island, um, I always try to stay out of it. Mm. Um, but I'm pretty sure, you know, if you see the developments in Playa and Bossa and all that, which has been um, through massive amounts of money that poured in there changed the face of the island and changed the way people go clubbing in Ibiza. And uh, so, you know, you still find those those spots, those places where the music is the most and foremost thing yeah. and the people enjoying it and not some bottle service, champagne spraying VIP table. Yeah. How does it feel saying that out loud that you are one of the longest running residents on Ibiza? I, I, I don't know. It's, it's just uh, just something that happened. <laughs> <laughs> it's like didn't, there was no agenda. I didn't didn't plan terrible. in 1999. Okay, I'm going to show you how it's going to be. Uh, I I didn't know. I was just. Uh, um, invited to play and uh, people seem to have enjoyed it otherwise I wouldn't have been invited back so um, I don't know it's uh, probably something um, you know that is something to be proud of in a way you know it's like if for that many years people invite you back and also the people that come to see me actually make me part of their holidays um, it's great I'm very grateful do you reflect on your career? Do you ever sit down and reflect or is it always looking forward? No, I'm just looking forward. It's like, it's, mm. it's always like the next release is the most important record I've ever done. Yeah. And uh, so this is, this is, this is, it, that's how it always has been for me. It's like, it's yeah. always about being able to make music. And I really hope um, that I will be until I retire at some point be able to make music and even after that I'm probably still going to make music maybe nobody's going to hear it but that's just I don't know it's almost like another language I speak is is there a retirement plan is there ever going to be a retirement well I'm I'm pretty sure at some point uh, you know it it will will stop um but uh, it's it doesn't seem to be the way yet I was just uh, talking to my agents yesterday and the whole year is already quite cramped and <laughs> I was asking could I have like one weekend off here maybe please and it's like look I'm complaining on a very very from a really high point it's like I'm so as I said grateful is probably the, the best word to describe it mm. that people after all these years still come out and, and want to see me and 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 listening to my music and I can tell you I still have a lot of music to give it, yeah. it, it it never it never stops kind of this whole okay i i could do it try like this or like that it's like this 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 whole almost childish approach to excitement um is still there mm, i love that sacrifices we all know as touring djs 
we have a lot of sacrifices to kind of give up in life, right? Or not not witness. Um, how have you been able to balance those throughout your life? Relationships, family, friends? Well, of course, it's never really that easy. It's like, you know, it's like throughout the year, it kind of develops them to maybe one, two, like really, really good friends. Because yeah. not many let's say friends have understanding that you're never there for a birthday because they yeah. usually celebrate it on the weekend. That's my core work day. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's things like this, of course, um, you know, there are things that aren't ideal, but I, I would never, never complain really, because the thing is I have been given the chance to make my passion back then my hobby into yeah. my profession and after all these years i'm still able to see the world to see people all over the world to kind of be inspired by everything that's globally going on and translate it into something that i love so much and that's music so whatever it is i can deal with it and as you get older into the career of where you're at now do you have you have you changed how you tour have you changed how you release music have you changed the team around you the people around you to kind of add value into out music life outside of music or or are you just still all, all steam ahead well it is all steam ahead of course but yeah it's, it's just like uh simply uh maybe doing things um, slightly more, you know, being aware of what's coming. As an example, I was never the kind of person when I had a show on Thursday who went completely bonkers. Yeah, uh, I gave everything musically and as a DJ, but you know, it's like I didn't party the crap out of it simply because I knew the people that paid to see me on Friday and on Saturday, uh, on Saturday, they deserve to get a hundred percent me. Yeah, and, and and that's my goal. That always has been my goal, and uh, it continues to be so. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's what I'm doing. But, um, you know, we still have the same professional approach to all the fun, to all excitement, to all the passion. But at the end of the day, I feel also responsible, you know, to not kind of be just a shadow of myself on stage and deliver, deliver utter crap. <laughs> <laughs> How do you stay healthy? Uh, it's like, you know, it, it's food, not overdoing whatever you do. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. you know, one of those things that I always done as an example, I always sleep before the show. So when other wow. people go to a bar or to have dinner or whatever, I'm sleeping. Mm. So if I'm going on at 12, you can be sure I'm sleeping at 1050. <laughs> yeah. And then I wake up, get ready and have a Red Bull. <laughs> On you go. <laughs> um, we, in this industry, we have like lots of things that like DJ Mag Top 100, Mix Mag, you were voted number one DJ on Mix Mag in 2005. Um, how do, how do external, external kind of awards, um, achievements, does that affect you? Do you worry about things like that? Have you worried about that in your in your career? Is it ever been a point where that's been your focus? I know you were Grammy nominated Grammy nominated as well for one of your albums. Um, well, it never has been a focus. It's obviously yeah. it's a great honor if you reach the top spot of the DJ Mag One Hundred or you receive certain awards. Then at the same time, I would say probably starting with. 2007 when everybody kind of like started to get an iphone and um, things have changed somehow because it's yeah. so easy now to participate in all these things um you know when when i was voted uh you know best dj in the world people actually had to fill in a postcard go to the yeah. post office and put it in that effort alone shows how much appreciation there was versus just kind of click 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 so yeah. it has definitely a different, um, I don't know, a different tone to it in a way. But at the end of the day, it, it, it never was what drives me. What drives me is really kind of seeing the reaction of what I do in front of me. I love that. 
I love that. It's it's very interesting to see the awards happening in because I think as a as especially as newer artists come through, I think a lot of people look at those awards as an achievement to to better your career and to kind of keep growing and growing and growing, which I totally understand, but I feel like there's a level of if you keep growing and you keep achieving, those awards will come anyway and you don't need to worry about them. Well, I don't know. It's like it seems to be far more. You need to be part of the gang in order to receive the award of the gang, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, that's understandable. Uh, Shine, Ibiza. Is this, this is your party, correct? Um, yes. It, well, it's, it's not just me doing it, but I'm, uh, let's say, um, the the one together with the team who initiated it. And uh, I don't know, we just saw that it's necessary to put on something in Ibiza that really focuses on on the power of music, on the energy and the love that this music creates and actually put the people itself in the focus and not just as the bystanders for VIPs to feel VIP. I understand. Um, how long have you been doing? When did this start? Uh, I think we're in the fifth year now. Fifth year. Yeah. Okay. Um, the the lineup the lineups have been announced for this year already. Mm -hmm. um, it's at Eden. Um, who chooses the lineups? Um, well, this is a it's, it's a decision by the team. I have a few people that I definitely want to have on, and then yeah. you know Alexa from the Berlin office actually has suggestions. Nick. Uh, who's like our man on the ground in Ibiza. And we all kind of like, you know, come up with the ideas, put it all together and see what's possible. Is that Nick from Cream? Yes, yes. Is he still doing it? Yes, wow. yes, yes. Please say hi from him. I haven't seen him for years. I will, I will. I, uh, yeah, wow. I didn't know Nick was behind it. Um, how does it feel? Have you, have you ever had your own night in Ibiza before? No, that was just... Uh, well, gee, I didn't really plan on, on, on that either. It was just yeah. that uh, suddenly the guys from from Cream decided um, to actually do something completely different yeah. that had nothing to do with what Cream stood for. Yeah. And uh, so we just kind of basically had to create a new home. Yeah. No, I love that. Um, how, many, how many dates is it this summer? <laughs> I don't know, 12, 13, something like that. I think I... Do you still like doing the like consistency in Ibiza every, every week, blah, blah, blah? Like, how do you find it? Well, we decided actually, it's like, because it worked very good last year. We make a break in the two weeks in August. So yeah. we have almost like two parts of the season. And uh, we noticed that this works actually out like like really well. Yeah, and uh, it gives me also the possibility to do at least these two weekends, other things during the summer in um, you know elsewhere on the planet. Yeah, I looked at your tour calendar already um, that's been announced, and I'm sure you kind of mentioned earlier that your tour calendar is filled up for the rest of the year. But I I see on your dates that it's filled up till September. Um, have you ever had parts in your career where? there's peaks and troughs where it's never like, okay, I'm not too sure where to go next. I'm not, I'm not the, the new kid on the block and I'm also not the, the most popular person on the block. Or have you always found like a consistent growth in your career or just a consistency? It is always a question of how you define that for yourself. Because if you, let's say, if you define your own value as an artist and as a person, yeah. By the dynamic of the music industry, you're going to end up very miserable. Mm. So what's really important and has always been very important to me is that I 100% 100% stand behind my music. Because, you know, like getting up in the morning, looking in the mirror and saying, yes, that's a really cool track that I've just did. Yeah. It's... This, this, this is something what keeps your life, what keeps you sane and also have an understanding of what it is. You know, I really appreciate like, you know, all the, 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 the people that sort of like, you know, say 
how much my music means to them. And when they come, I was like, oh, you're a legend and so on. But I know that probably 99% of all these people, they're standing in front of somebody else the next day and saying, oh, yeah. you're my legend. So I, I, I can put that into the right perspective. And as I said, I am very grateful for the fact that people still, after all these years, come to see me, take the effort and take time out of their day to listen to my music. And that means much, much more than, I don't know, any popularity contests, any up and downs and whatsoever. Um, and um, yeah, I'm I'm doing what I love doing. And uh, this seems to be coming across and that's why people come to see me. That makes me happy, man. It's really nice to hear. Um, before we wrap up, I text one of my really, or my best friend. He's a huge trance fan and is a huge Paul Van Dyke fan. And I never really do this, but I knew he'd absolutely love this. So I was like, dude, I'm speaking to Paul Van Dyke on the podcast today. And like, have you got a question you want to ask? And he was like, damn, you stumped me. But he was like, yeah, but your record home. His question was your record home. He's always wanted to know the meaning behind the lyrics. Well, first of all, um, I, I I wrote Home together with uh, a phenomenal music, Johnny McDade. Yeah. And uh, he just has the ability to put, you know, his interface inspiration is into writing and then singing it. And it's, it's pretty much whatever home defines for yourself. To me, and Johnny does that like almost no one else. You never get the whole story. You get sketches and then you have to kind of get into it and make that track your own. So ideally, yeah. home means to me exactly what it means to you, but something yeah. very different. It sounds very cryptic, but I hope you, you get what I mean. Totally get it. Totally get it. <laughs> Paul, we've just done an hour. Uh, I can't thank you enough for coming on the podcast. Like, I really do appreciate you coming on. Um, congratulations on your career. You have been, from the get-go, one of the biggest inspirations in the industry, and, and, and you keep going, which I think is an amazing thing for new artists to see and also artists that are, have had success and, and go, currently going through it and, and just to see you keep pushing on and keep growing and, and keep building in this industry is absolutely amazing. Thank you very much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Have Big love, man. Bye. Thank you.